so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. This episode deals with sexual assault and suicide. Listener discretion is advised. Hanging from a mango tree on the edge of their village in Uttar Pradesh are the bodies of two girls. It's May 27, 2014, and the sun is just beginning to rise in India's north. It's already blisteringly hot, the air thick and overbearing. A man, a member of the village, is the first to see them, the two girls who went missing last night. Lali is 14, her lifeless body beside her 16-year-old cousin, Padma. They were inseparable in life, neighbours who were actually more like sisters. Their parents had been desperately trying to find them. They will eventually be called to this orchard and they will see what became of their daughters. But when they find them, they do not take their bodies down. Their mistrust of police is so great that they wait for a man they trust to arrive. The family think that the police will ensure that these girls are forgotten, their deaths ignored by the justice system. Instead, the women of the family guard their bodies as they are exposed to the heat, factors that will make it increasingly difficult to determine what happened to them. On that day in May 2014, photographs are taken of a scene that is shared all around the world. These girls' lives mattered, and with a spotlight on this small village in India, it's critical that they determine what happened. I'm Jessie Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking with award-winning journalist and narrative non-fiction writer Sonia Falero about her new book, The Good Girls, which investigates the murder of two girls from northern India. Padma and Lali were cousins with a two-year age gap. Can you describe their relationship growing up? Padma and Lali actually grew up next door to each other because they lived in what is called a joint family where, you know, several generations of a family, generally the sons of one family, live together with their wives and their children and the grandparents. And Padma and Lali's house was essentially one room, one room for each family, divided by a low wall. And the purpose of that particular kind of structure was to give the families a sense of autonomy, while at the same time allowing the kids to grow up together. And that's what Padma and Lali did. They saw each other literally from morning to night. And because they were so close in age, and because, you know, in the village, Parents are very, very careful about who their children, particularly their girls, socialize with. They were encouraged to hang out primarily with each other, to not seek friendships outside the house, even friendships in school. So by dint of circumstance, by dint of persuasion from their own families, these two little girls did everything together. They went to school and they grazed the goats and they spent all their free time, whatever little free time they had, in each other's company. And they grew up in a small village in India. How would you describe that village? So the village is called Katra Sadat Ganj, and it's about six hours outside of the national capital, Delhi. And, you know, when I arrived at Katra the first time, which was about a year after the children had died, I thought, This is idyllic. And it is at first sight. It's how you imagine a village should look like. Beautiful green fields and little rivers and tall trees, kind of exotic animals. You know, you have a nilgai or blue bull that come to the fields at night and a little bit of danger as well in the form of rather venomous snakes such as cobras. 
And village life in Katra is quite cozy and intimate. The houses are neatly organized. They are cheek by jowl. Everybody knows everybody else. And you do see at very first sight signs of government failure. So, for example, the piles of garbage. That's definitely there. You see that the kids who go to the government school aren't very well dressed. But you don't see poverty because virtually everybody in that village has a piece of land. And men and women alike work that land. And men and women alike, irrespective of whether or not they're literate, and most of the adults cannot read or write, they nevertheless have all chosen to send their children to private school where they learn English, math, and science. So, you know, it is very much an Indian village in how it appears, but it is also very much a modern village in which parents want better for their children. And these girls were 14 and 16, I believe, when they went missing. That was in May 2014. What do we know about where they went on that night in May? Well, one of the things that we do know about the day is that it was the most exciting day of the children's life because for the first time ever, they were allowed to go to the village fair. And the village fair was a dinky little affair. There was a little Ferris wheel, there's snacks, there's a little bit of shopping. But by the end of it, the girls were giddy. They had never been allowed to cross the road that led into the bazaar where the fair was held. And that freedom and the fact that they were able to do it together made them feel like, wow, I mean, things are really looking up. You know, we are growing up. So that was the feeling with which they ended the day, a feeling of what felt to me to be almost triumph and certainly joy. And as soon as they returned home, they went back into the normal routine. Padma went to her stepmother and helped her prepare the evening's meal. Lali went to her mother and did virtually the same thing. They were mirror images of each other across the little wall, doing their chores, eating their supper, helping clean up. And then, you know, Padma at some point crossed the courtyard to the home of a third cousin because it was a set of three little homes. And in the course of some chit chat, she said quite loudly something along the lines of, you know, I'm not feeling very well. I think I'm going to go to the fields. And Lali, as was her wont, because Lali and Padma did everything together, including going to the fields where, you know, they did their toilet. Lali piped up and said, oh, well, I have to go as well, so I'll go with you. And again, this was part of their routine. They did not break routine. They always went to the fields. One last time before they went to bed, it's worth emphasizing that like many families in their village, they did not have a toilet at their house, not for a lack of money, but because their parents, primarily the men in the family, didn't see any reason to have a toilet when the fields were there for their use. And their mothers who were with them at the time barely raised their faces to look at the girls because, again, this was normal. And Padma had a mobile phone. The girls knew how to use phones. They had access to several, in fact. And because the mothers knew that the girls were just doing what they always did and they had a phone, there was no cause for concern. So off the girls went to the fields with their phone in hand. And how far were the fields from where they lived? Were they close? The fields are about 10 minutes or so. So you step out of the big old wooden door that leads into this little house of theirs, this collection of houses, I should say, and you walk down a mud slope. And then you walk through these narrow mud alleys. And at that time of night, people are getting ready to go to bed. It's only about nine or so. But because this is a farming village, everybody goes to bed early and wakes up at about 4.30. So the houses that do have Far, very few of them, they have already switched off their lights. Those that rely on solar lights, those are being switched off as well. And so you walk down these narrow mud roads. You can hear the dogs barking but for the last few times, just before they themselves curl up to sleep. Now you're starting to hear the crickets. The wind begins to pick up and things are getting quite quiet. You walk through the darkness until you find yourself quite quickly in front of what seems to be an enormous carpet of crops just unfolding 
before you. And although the villagers were poor and they had very tiny pieces of land, each to a family, collectively it was a large, large field full of tobacco and garlic and some vegetables, full of tall trees and darkness because there is no electricity. And so all you see is the light of the stars and the sound of the trees and footsteps of the last few people who are going back and forth using the toilet. At what point did their families discover that they were gone, they hadn't come back? So around half an hour later, Padma's stepmother, who, you know, had a very contentious relationship with Padma for a variety of reasons. Firstly, because Padma was 16 and, you know, like all teenagers, it was a bit of a power struggle with her parents, but particularly so with her stepmother, because she felt that her stepmother didn't love her the way her biological mother would have. So Padma's stepmother, Sunita Devi, got a bit annoyed that Padma hadn't shown up. And the reason for the annoyance very likely was that Sunita Devi, the stepmother, was going to join her husband in the animal shelter where they tended to spend the night. The animal shelter was a house on its own. And they spent the night there to get some privacy. So as long as Padma didn't come home, Sunita Devi couldn't go and join her husband. So she got a bit upset and went to the door of the courtyard and said, where are these girls? And at the same time, Padma and Lali's grandmother, who is very close to both girls, but particularly to Padma, having brought her up after her biological mother had died, was extremely concerned. And, you know, she's a very elderly woman. She's sort of whispers and bones in a widow's white sari. She usually just stays in one place on the cot. But that moment frightened her so much, even though she couldn't articulate what it was that frightened her, that she got off the cot and went walking to the door of the courtyard and stuck her head out and said, Padma, Lali, and of course, heard nothing back. And there were no more phones in the house to call the girls, even if there had been phones. At that moment, there were only women in the house and the women of the house could not use phones. So they were stranded there, this group of women, the mothers with various children running underfoot, completely confused about where their girls had gone because nothing like this had ever happened before. You know, this is a house that ran like clockwork. Everybody had a job to do and everybody did it promptly. And this was almost like, wait, a puzzle piece has gone missing and I don't understand why. And when did they go to the police? Was that the next step? That was actually not the next step. A series of events took place afterwards that involved a lot of running around in the darkness of the fields, searching for the girls. While the women are in the house wondering what to do next, Padma's father, Jeevanlal, was in the animal shelter. And uh, Jeevanlal was settling into his cot when he had a frantic knocking on the door. Again, something very unusual at that time of night in a village like Kachwa Sadatganj. He leapt off the cot and went running to the door, and there stood his cousin. His cousin Nazru was a man in his 20s, and Nazru was one of those figures that I think we all recognize. Very confused, said something when he meant something entirely different, not entirely reliable, a likable fellow, but not somebody who could be taken at his word. You know, if he said something, you always wondered, is it true or should I just double check? right? Like he says it's raining, but I better just look out of the window just in case. So Nasru stood there and he said, which means thieves in the field. Now thieves were a problem in the field, especially during the harvest time. They came from neighboring villages and they scooped up all the cut bundles of crops. And then there were also more serious thieves who came for motorcycles. And there had been rumors in villages like this that, you know, there were groups of bandits who took more than crops and motorcycles. They came for women. So when Nazru said there are thieves in your field, Jeevan Lal had no reason to believe that this was one of Nazru's exaggerations. He immediately picked up his bamboo stick and he raced after Nazru towards his fields. And as he was running, he called his oldest brother, Sohanlal, 
who was Lali's father. But Sohan Lal was not in the village at that time. Sohan Lal was out of the village. He'd gone to perform some errands. So he was not available. So Jeevan Lal called his third brother. There were three brothers in all. And that brother had just arrived back home. And Jeevan Lal says to him, look, there are thieves in the field. Hurry up, hurry up. The brother, Ram Babu, does exactly what Jeevan Lal did. He picks up a bamboo stick and he also takes a torch and he goes running into the fields. So now the streets of Katra are thudding with the footsteps of three men racing in the fields looking for alleged thieves. They reach the fields, they announce to whoever may be listening, whoever may be around because they can't see very well, there are thieves in the field, help us please, there are thieves in the field. And a couple more men who happen to be around also join, very determined to make sure that their fields are protected by the intruders. But they see nothing. It's quiet. There's not even a, a memory of an intruder of any sort. And the men are baffled. They just stand there wondering, wait, what? What just happened? And as they're standing there scratching their heads, the girls' mothers come running from the house. And this is, again, something that never happens because the women would have gone to the toilet earlier. They do not wander around the village, certainly not in the fields after dark. They come running. They said, the girls are gone. The girls are gone. And without a second thought, the men drop all talk of thieves. That matter's forgotten. And they go running back into the village. And the intention is to gather their thoughts and to figure out what to do next. But one person stays back. Her name is Sia Devi. And Sia Devi is the mother of Lali, the younger girl, the 14-year-old. Sia Devi is, in a sense, she's one of those women you meet in a lot of Indian villages. She was married off when she was 16, which is below the legal age. She was married off to a man she never met. She only saw him the day she was married. She was considered his property and had to have her arm tattooed with his name. So she has her husband's name tattooed on her arm. And she was, even today, you can see this incredible beauty and fierce intelligence. And this fiercely intelligent, incredibly strong woman stays back in the fields while everybody goes away because she is grappling with this thing that's just happened. And as she's trying to put everything together to figure it out, she comes across Nazru, Nazru, the unreliable cousin. And then Nazru is zipping his trousers after taking a leak. And he says to Nazru, the girls are gone. And Nazru nods with great confidence and says, yes, yes, Papu took them. And Lali's mother, Sia Devi, cannot believe her ears. Now, she doesn't know exactly who this Papu is, but she knows the name and she knows that he belongs to a different caste from a different part of the village. And none of that actually matters at this point. The fact is that he said the name of a man. He said a man took the girls and, you know, that's enough. And she just runs. She picks up her sari and runs back home. and. Now the family has to grapple with the news that the children have been abducted by a man and are nowhere to be seen. They were found the following morning. What had happened to the two girls? At the time when they were found, they were hanging from a tree. They were hanging from a tree in the mango orchard that was at the bottom of the fields and that they themselves had frequented as children. Those were the trees that were their playground because there wasn't a playground in the village. They would run up and down those trees and steal mangoes from those trees when they were little girls. But there they were found early the next morning by a group of villagers who was passing through. And then the news spread like wildfire. And of course, everybody came running the girls' mothers and all the children in the village. And they looked at these bodies and they couldn't understand. They couldn't, I mean, how do you make sense of this, right? How, if you see a dead body, I mean, the natural response isn't to say, well, I know what happened because you don't, right? And they didn't either. And so they're looking at these bodies and wondering, how did this happen? Now, this is not a village, as, alas, some villages in India are, it is not known 
for violent incidents. It's a village where basically everybody gets along and they have arguments over straying goats and, you know, a little bit of drunkenness at a wedding, but not violence. And here are two girls hanging in a tree. But because they were girls and because this is a village of lower caste people and because the nearby villages were occupied by people of a dominant caste. And by dominant, I don't mean upper caste. I mean simply having more power because of a certain set of circumstances. The villagers immediately assumed that the children had been abducted, that they had been raped, and they had been killed. And they had been hanged in the tree rather than having been disposed of or their bodies being hidden because the dominant castes who they assumed were responsible for their killing truly didn't care. I mean, they cared so little that they were making a mockery of what they had done to these children. And that was the sense that the villagers had when they looked at their children in the tree. Interestingly, a point you make in the book is that their mothers almost stood there and wouldn't let anyone take their bodies for a while because they were so afraid that the police would pretend like this hadn't happened or jump straight to suicide rather than doing a proper post-mortem. Eventually they did have someone come along to take the bodies. What made the women trust that this would be done properly? Yeah, this is such an interesting question. The answer tells you so much about how modern India works. So the police in India are extremely understaffed and extremely under-resourced. So in places like Uttar Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh is India's largest state. It's got more than 200 million people. There are police stations which don't have phones. There's no question of computers. They don't have transportation. There's very little they can do and they don't have the training. So, you know, one of the things I point out in the book is an acceptable method in lieu of setting up a cordon around a dead body is basically for the police to stand there flapping their hands like bystanders are pigeons. And that is not how you protect a crime scene. So they don't have the training and they don't have resources. Virtually all the police officers who end up playing a role in the story did the best they could do. It's just that their best was quite poor. So because they don't know, because they cannot do anything more, they look at these cases and they say, look, I mean, it's a girl of marriageable age. Let's just say she ran off and got into a spot of trouble and call it a day. And, you know, this sort of behavior has become routine and they're never called into check because the police officers who are their bosses have also done the same thing throughout their careers. So the women in the village, not knowing how to read and write, not having television or newspapers, were still deeply aware of how things work in India and how people are treated to know that the police would take one look at this scene and say, well... I'm going to put it down to a suicide and call it a day. And they didn't want that to happen. They didn't know what had happened to their children, but they wanted to know. They wanted a fair chance. I can't emphasize this enough. This is such an extraordinary act of courage in the Indian context. You know, this is not Delhi, right, where you have young women with, you know, good jobs and driving cars and speaking English. This is a state where women literally sit on the floor because they cannot sit at the same level as men. So men sit on chairs and women sit on floors. So why did these women who are accustomed to keeping their mouths zipped even imagine that such a thing was possible? And the reason they imagined it was because they had heard about the 2012 Delhi bus gang rape. A young woman in Delhi, a physiotherapy student, and a friend having watched the life of Pai get on a bus in Delhi, thinking it's a public bus. And instead, the men inside rape and torture her. And this promising young woman, with her whole life ahead of her, dies a few days later. And India responded with the largest ever protests against sexual violence the country has seen in its history changing the laws, changing so very much. And these women, again, had heard that story all the way from Delhi. They had heard the story of what protests can do. So their experience of the police, the story they had heard of the protests, and the fact that they themselves were strong women, tough women, made them think, hey, we can do this. 
let's do this. Why do we wait for the men? And the person they were waiting for was not the police. It was not just some politician. It was a politician who belongs specifically to their caste, because that is how Uttar Pradesh specifically works. Whoever is in power doesn't feel that they represent their constituency. They believe they represent the people of their caste and everybody else can, you know, do what they want. It doesn't matter. So they were waiting for the politician of their caste because they felt that he alone could understand them and would fight for them. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Jessie Stevens. I'm speaking with award-winning journalist Sonia Falero about her book, The Good Girls. What did the post-mortem find? The initial post-mortem found that the children did not have any physical injuries. They did not have any internal injuries. But the doctor who was assigned to specifically examine whether they had been the victims of sexual assault felt that they had been victims of sexual assault. And that is what she wrote in her post-mortem report. She says, and I'm paraphrasing, it looks like they have been raped, but she used the specific word rape. And how is that contested? From someone who has never conducted a post-mortem or isn't a doctor, you would think that there are facts and there are clear signs that someone has or hasn't been raped. How did that become contested and later on people say that in fact these two girls hadn't been raped? Well I want to start by just walking you through this post-mortem house where the bodies were examined. It is a crumbling little room in a buffalo field. It is so filthy that if you entered it you would want to leave immediately and have a thorough scrub down. Everything is covered with dust There are literally cobwebs hanging from the roof. There is no electricity. And it looks like an abandoned building. It looks like a place where, you know, derelicts would shoot drugs. And it is actually that sort of place. That is the place where postmortems are supposed to be conducted in that particular area of Uttar Pradesh. But the person who conducts the postmortem, it would be wrong to call him a pathologist because he's not a trained medical profession. He was actually a sweeper at the hospital who was given this job because no one else wanted it. Even the sweeper found it so filthy that he started, again, to say examine the bodies would be incorrect, to chop up the bodies outside. So in this area, postmortems are being conducted by people without medical qualifications who are using quite literally butcher's knives purchased at the local bazaar. Now, in normal circumstances, the same gentleman, Lala Ram, who is the the sweeper who examines the bodies, would have been the only one examining Padma and Lali. But because by the evening the case was all over the news and it was the only thing anybody in India with the television was talking about, several other doctors were called in. Now, there were three other doctors present And none of them were pathologists. In India, there is a lingering sense that comes from strictures of caste in Hinduism that touching a dead body makes you impure because the dead body is impure. So medical professionals avoid touching dead bodies. And there is a shortage of pathologists. So it means that people like Lala Ram do the job. And even when you get other doctors to supervise, quote unquote, those doctors literally will not touch the dead body. And in any case, they're not qualified, right? I mean, you can't have a dentist examining a body. I mean, you might as well not have anybody then. So that night, that grimy postmortem room was somehow cleaned up. And they installed a generator for light and there was no fan, so it was dreadfully hot. And you had Lala Ram, the sweeper, and three other doctors, none of whom were qualified to do this job. And because the victims were girls and because sexual assault was suspected, the doctor leading the postmortem felt that he needed to have a female doctor. Now, again, there was nobody available. So they ended up getting a GP. I mean... A GP, you know, I mean, I just, I, I just had a 
call with my GP yesterday and he gave me some hay fever medicine to think that that gentleman might end up examining me if I died. It just makes no sense to me. But there you go. A GP from the women's hospital was called over. She had obviously never conducted a postmortem before, obviously knew nothing. And she's looking at these bodies and she has been told by the police that we suspect sexual assault. Now, What I was told later was that, you know, all the families and many other villagers besides were pressing their bodies against the gates of the postmortem house because they were distraught, right? I mean, they'd just seen their children in a tree. So there was a lot of police presence. There were a lot of villagers. There was a lot of noise. There was the generator. There is no fan. And there are all these people pressed together in a moment of extreme tension. And this woman who should not have been doing that job looked at the bodies and said yes it looks like rape and that's what went into the report even though by the way under Indian law uh, postmortem is not supposed to use that word the courts have said that rape is not a medical term it's a legal term you have to describe the injuries, the suspected manner of injuries, and so on and so forth. So, you know, she showed her ignorance for which she cannot be blamed in many, many ways. But her word was taken as gospel because that's what people believed. And if you tell people what they believe, then that is it. That's fact. And there were arrests made in the aftermath. Who were they looking at as potential perpetrators? Immediately, suspicion fell on Papu. Papu was the man that Nazru, the distracted cousin, had claimed had snatched the girls. Papu was a 19-year-old tobacco farmer, a tiny, reedy fellow who couldn't read or write, just about managed to write his pet name, which was Papu. His real name is Darvesh Yadav. And Papu lived with two brothers, a sister-in-law, parents, and a couple of buffaloes in a relatively comfortable house just down the road from Katra Sadatganj in a hamlet where everybody else basically lived in some version of a shack. But Papu's family had made money farming watermelons and they had invested it. So they had an actual, you know, concrete house that made them stand out. But they were still desperately poor and suspicion fell on Papu. But When it became clear to everybody, even those who definitely wanted Papu to be punished, that this one man abducts two girls, rapes two girls, strangles two girls, and then hangs two girls on a tree all by himself in a field where, you know, you can hear the slithering of a snake. When that became obvious to everybody, the story started to broaden to include other people And the other people were Papu's two brothers, his older brothers, and two police officers who were a part of the group of police officers who lived down the road and who hadn't done very much to help the family. So a group of people who were not seen that night in the fields, who had no known links to the children other than Papu, as we later find out, were accused of these terrible crimes and they were all arrested. Within a matter of hours, they were all arrested. Theories eventually changed over the course of the case towards a theory of suicide, which was based on the evidence and looking at how the girls died. Why would two girls of this age consider suicide? Why did they think there was a motivation to do that? Yeah, this is just something so, so sad. You know, they were very smart. They were loved by all. They were valued by members of their community. And obviously, when anybody dies young, you think of all things that could have been. And it's no different with these two wonderful young girls, Padma and Lali. In the absence of any evidence to show that they had been abducted, raped or killed, and in the presence of evidence to show that they did in fact take their lives. I think that one can only conclude that they were aware of what it meant in a village like Katra 
to be said to have had sex with a man who they were not married to. They understood what the repercussions would be for them personally. They understood the repercussions for their family. And they understood that, you know, in a place like Katra, for people like them, to have sex is considered on par with having committed some sort of vile crime. And you carry the stamp of that vile crime almost on your body, you know, the scarlet letter. Everybody knows it. And people don't come to you. They don't come to your doorstep for a glass of water. They don't come to your house for food. You're not invited to the village festivals. You are ostracized. And in a village, that is all you have, right? You you don't have anything else. It's you and your neighbors. There is no world outside of your village. So if you are ostracized in your village, not for a few weeks or months, but for your lifetime, and that impacts all the children who are yet to be married, the fact that nobody will marry them. So you're impacted for generations. That burden, the burden of that responsibility is placed on you as a family member. And then it crushes the person who has actually had sex with somebody or or found to have had sex with somebody. And I think those children felt it very much. And, you know, look, these are teenagers, okay? Teenagers, whether they are in rural India whether they are anywhere in the world, are the same. Let's not forget that. I mean, they are going to be sexually active. They are going to be, you know, doing all the things that kids do, right? I mean, we've all done it. The difference is that in a place like Delhi, for example, you are also going to be very secretive about sexual activity until you're married, even though Delhi is a completely different ball game. And and if you are found out, you're going to get into a, a hell of trouble. But Death is probably not going to be the outcome for anybody. But in a village like Katra Sadat Ganj, you can be a teenager, but you better hide it because everybody's looking at you. Everybody's watching you. And if they find out what you've done, then, you know, there is only one outcome. And the children knew that. But were you able to determine what they had done or what rumours were surfacing before they died? It seems from the testimony of Papu Yadav, as well as witness accounts, that the children, Padma and Lali, had become friends with Papu. Papu was 19, Padma was 16, Lali was 14. You know, it made perfect sense that they would bump into each other in the fields while Papu was grazing his animals and the girls were grazing their animals. They allegedly got to talking, and the girls gave Papu their mobile number. They had access to several phones, one of which was exclusively Padma's. And what they said to Papu apparently was, you know, give us a missed call and we will call you when we are safe. So we know from call data that uh, hundreds of calls, more than 300 calls, were exchanged between the phone that was owned by Papu and two phones that were used by Padma and Lali. And, you know, the calls came from both phones. So, and the reason it's important to make that point is because, you know, one of the things that does tend to happen in places in India is that young men get a phone number of a young woman and they call her incessantly and just harass her, right? But we know from the fact that these calls went both ways, that they lasted several minutes, stretched over a six-month period, that the calls were mutual. So witness testimony, medical evidence, uh, call records, and Papu's testimony tell us that the teenagers knew each other and had a relationship. What we know about this relationship comes from Papu Yadav exclusively. And what he says is that he and Padma entered into a sexual relationship and they would meet regularly in the fields. And on the night that the girls went to the fields, it was because they had agreed to meet with Papu, their friend Papu, in the fields. And as Padma and Papu were getting together, you know, they started removing their clothes. Nazru, the nosy cousin, who had in fact been following the girls for several weeks and in fact had been a witness to a prior meeting between the girls and the boy, stepped out and saw them. He saw Padma in a state of undress. He saw Papu in a state of undress. And Papu picked up his trousers and, without looking back, ran away. 
And that left Padma and Lali. And Nazru took one look at them and he ran off to inform their family in the roundabout fashion that he ended up with. So you had these girls there having been seen in that state and then hiding in the fields, investigators believe, as the fields filled with people looking for them. Finally, I just wanted to ask, it's such a tragedy and you get a sense of the loss and not only of these two children but of women in India who are, I don't want to use the word oppressed necessarily, but this system of honour that seems to be so important in Indian culture. What did you discover by investigating this story and spending time in this village and looking at it for, you know, more than four years as you did? What does this story tell us more broadly about women in India and what needs to be done? You know, one of the things that I always emphasize is how much these girls were loved, you know, because we talk about things like honor killings and, you know, this incredible sort of entrenched pattern of number one, violence against women, but also, you know, something that we really need to discuss more often, which is just keeping girls and women back all the time, every step of the way. You know, maybe you don't beat your child. Maybe you do everything in your power to protect her from assault, but you're still feeding her less than you feed your son. You're still not that interested in getting her vaccinated or giving her health care or making sure she goes to a good school. So you have a pattern of neglect on the one hand, right? On the other hand, you adore your kids, I mean, Padma and Lali were loved, loved, loved. But these two things go together. You can love somebody. Anybody who's been in a toxic relationship knows this. You can love somebody and you can still not do right by them. And that is what you're seeing with girls in India. You know, this is not a lack of love. It's incorrect to say that boys are loved more. Boys are simply seen as a better investment in a rather cold-blooded way because they are more likely to get jobs and make money. They are seen as an investment. They're not loved more. But the relationship between parents and daughters is toxic from birth to death. And the other thing that we're seeing is that, you know, this is a country that is giving things to people. You have mobile phones in villages where you don't have running water, right? But you will have somebody sitting there. It's like one of those pictures you see in National Geographic, right? A woman completely covered head to toe in a sari sending WhatsApp messages. So she has the stuff, they've got the technology. And there is this talk about, wow, we are going to be a superpower. Well, I'm sorry, it's not going to happen because it's not about things. It's about ideas. You know, it's about how you see the world and the place of people in it. And if you see the world as a world of men first, a country of boys and men, you're always going to be held back. You're always going to encourage violence. You're always going to have, you know, millions of people not being able to fulfill their potential. And the country itself is being held back because there is a lack of respect for women and a lack of vision. There's no lack of love. But you know what? It's not enough. It's just not enough. Sonia Falero is an accomplished journalist with a number of literary works to her name. Her latest book, The Good Girls, which tells the story of Padma and Lali, has been called Transfixing by the New York Times and a riveting, sometimes astonishing work of forensic journalism by the Wall Street Journal. You can find a link to it in our show notes. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jessie Stevens. Sound design is by Ian Camilleri and our producer is Gia Moylan. If you'd like to discuss today's episode with other true crime fans, search True Crime Conversations on Facebook and join our online community. And if you don't want to miss a single episode, make sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts.